بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد on friday we completed hadith number 333 the next chapter in hadith from at tajid al sarih the abridged version of imam bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi's famous sahih bab waqt al zuhri 'inda al zawal chapter about the time of zuhr being at noon chapter time of zuhr is at noon as i mentioned in the chapter before this from this section onwards imam bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi is discussing the times of salah and he begins with zuhr rather than fajr in the tradition of the muhaddithin because when jibril alayhi salatu wasalam descended upon the earth and led the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in salah and showed him and demonstrated the salah to him along with its timings he descended at the time of zuhr and the first salah which he performed with rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was that of zuhr and not fajr and he did this for two days zuhr asr maghrib isha fajr and then the second day zuhr asr maghrib isha fajr so because of that hadith because of that tradition it's always been the custom of the muhaddithin to begin with the timings of zuhr and then end with fajr so imam bukhari rahmatullahi mentions the beginning time of zuhr here in the last session i discussed the desirable time of zuhr and i mentioned that because of these ahadith the ulama of the hanafi fiqh imam abu hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi imam abu yusuf and imam muhammad and their followers along with imam malik and imam ahmad ibn hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi and their followers all consider it desirable and commendable that a person delays the dhuhr salah in summer because of the extreme heat and pray dhuhr when the heat is less intense and the weather has cooled down slightly this is according to the three imams according to imam shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi no regardless of the heat and the timing and regardless of the season whether it's winter or summer zuhr salah should be performed at the beginning time i mentioned that throughout this throughout this book and for many sections well for many sections of this book when we will be discussing timings we will be discussing two kinds of timings and this is very important the first timing is that of the validity of salah from the beginning of the time of that salah till the end a person can pray salah any time in between this beginning and end and the salah is valid then we have the recommended or desirable and sunnah time the preferred time which is a portion of the valid time and i explained about isha isha begins with the disappearance of twilight and ends with the crack of dawn now this is the valid time however when we look at the hadith it was the custom of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to delay isha salah so they would pray it late into the night so that's the desirable recommended and sunnah timing of salah later on in the night however if a person does not act on this desirable and recommended time 
which itself is a subject of debate because different ulama have different opinions as to which is a desirable time, just as I've explained about Zuhr. That according to Imam Shafi'i, it's desirable time, it's at the very beginning. And according to the other Imams, it's desirable time is later on in the afternoon when the heat is less intense. So this preferred time is a subject of debate amongst the ulama for virtually all of the salawat, with the exception of Maghrib, where everybody agrees that Maghrib salah should be performed as soon as the sun has set. That is the desirable, recommended, and sunnah time for Maghrib. So if a person for whatever reason does not pray salah in the desirable mustahab time, the salah is still valid. So we'll be discussing both timings, as I mentioned before, just keep this in mind. Now, we've already discussed the preferred and desirable timing for Zuhr, which is uh, at the beginning in, summer, in winter, and if the heat is not intense, and delayed slightly until the heat is less intense in summer. Now we discuss the beginning time of Zuhr. All of the ulama agree, all the four imams and the major scholars of Islam agree that Zuhr time begins afternoon. So if noon is precisely at 12, then once the sun begins to decline, after high noon, after the zenith, after its peak in the horizon, uh, in, in the sky, then Zuhr time begins. So Zuhr time does not begin precisely at noon, but afternoon, slightly afternoon, once the sun begins to decline, <coughs> afternoon. And this is what Imam Bukhari is mentioning in this hadith. Hadith number 334. عن أنس رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خرج حين زاغت الشمس أنس رضي الله عنه It is related from Anas رضي الله عنه that Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم came out when the sun had declined فصل الظهر He then prayed ظهر فقام على المنبر he then stood upon the member, the pulpit, for the Qur'as Sa'a. He then mentioned the hour of judgment. For the Qur'an fiha umuran idama. And he mentioned that therein were great events. Thumma qal, he then said, Man ahabba an yas'ala an shay'in fal yas'al. Whoever desires, to ask about anything, then let him ask. فَلَا تَسْأَلُونِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَخْبَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ مَا دُمْتُ فِي مَقَامِي هَذَا For you will not ask me about anything, except that I will inform you of it, as long as I remain in this place of mine. فَأَكْثَرَ النَّاسُ فِي الْبُكَاءِ So the people began crying excessively. Or the people wept excessively. And the Prophet ﷺ began saying more, <coughs> ask me. So Abdullah ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi stood up. And he asked, who is my father? The Prophet ﷺ said, Abuka Hudhafa. Your father is Hudhafa. ثُمَّ أَكْثَرَ أَنْ يَقُولَ سَلُونِي Then the Prophet ﷺ continued to increase the frequency of saying, Ask me. فَبَرَّكَ عُمَرُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ عَلَى رُكْبَتَيْهِ فَقَالْ So Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه knelt upon his knees and said, رَضِيْنَا بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينَا وَبِمُحَمَّدِ النَّبِيَّا فَسَكَتْ We are content with Allah as a Lord. And with Islam as a religion, and with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a messenger, then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fell silent. ثم قال, then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "عرضت علي الجنة والنار آنف في عرض هذا الحائط." Jannah, paradise and the fire, were both 
presented to me just now in the center of this wall. Thus, I did not see anything before as good and as evil as this. That's the hadith. Now, Imam Zainuddin Zabidi rahmatullahi alayhi at the end of the hadith says, قَدْ تَقَدَّمَ بَعْضُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ فِي كِتَابِ الْعِلْمِ مِنْ رِوَايَةِ أَبِي مُوسَى لَكِنْ فِي هَذِهِ الْرِوَايَةِ زِيَادَةٌ وَمُغَايَرَةُ أَلْفَاظِ Part of this hadith has already passed before in the Book of Knowledge from the narration of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu an. But in this narration, there is additional wording and a difference. There is an addition and a difference of wording. Now, this hadith has passed before and we studied it. It wasn't as long as this. It was a slightly abridged version narrated from a different Sahabi radiyallahu ta'ala in the Book of Knowledge. Hadith number 81. It is related from Abu Musa radiyallahu anhu. I'll just translate it quickly. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about things which he disapproved of. Then... When this became excessive upon him, he, felt he became angry and then said, Ask me whatever you wish. So a man said, Who is my father? Prophet said, Your father is Hudhafa. Another stood up and said, Who is my father, Ya Rasulullah? So the Prophet said, Your father is Salim, the freed slave or the, the Mawla of Shayba, the client of Shayba. Then when Umar radiallahu ta'ala an saw the anger in the noble face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, we repent to Allah the Almighty. Now that's the translation of the hadith, hadith number 81, which is about the same incident but narrated by a different sahabi radiallahu an. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala an relates the same incident but with in more detail. Now, since this uh, hadith is much longer, and narrated from a different Sahabi. I'll explain this hadith as it is here. Anything which I've already explained in hadith number 81, I will not repeat. The Prophet ﷺ was extremely angry for some reason. And he came and he led Salah, he led Zuhr Salah. Before I continue with the explanation of the hadith, I'd just like to mention one, two things. As I repeatedly say, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi has selected a pool of about 2,000 hadith from a wider selection of hundreds of thousands. Now, in his opinion, and in the opinion of the majority of this ummah, this 2000 collection of hadith of his, which meets his most stringent requirements, they constitute and form the most authentic and reliable and trustworthy collection of ahadith in the whole of the Islamic world and in Islamic history. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi views many other ahadith to be sahih and authentic. But for this book, he applied certain conditions. And he set certain standards. And only when, the, when ahadith met those standards, those stringent requirements, did he include those ahadith in his book. So he has this pool of about 2,000 hadith. Now, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi also wishes to demonstrates many different points of hadith, many different points of everyday life, many different aspects of Islam in this book. He also wishes to explain as many rulings of fiqh as possible by using this collection of 2000 hadith. However, whatever point he mentions, he must prove that point, substantiate it and demonstrate it by using a hadith or a few ahadith from this collection of his, not from anywhere else. 
So even if, and giving a specific example, he is discussing the beginning time of Dhuhr Salah. He is discussing the beginning time of Asr Salah, or the beginning time of Maghrib Salah. Now if for any reason, there are many hadith that are to be found in the wider collection of hadith, considered reliable by most of the ulama of Islam, and also considered reliable by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi himself. But those hadith are authentic even in his own view. However, they do not meet the special conditions of this book of Bukhari of his. He will not mention those hadith at all. So Imam Bukhari is then forced himself, because of his stringent conditions, to search for a hadith in his own pool and collection of about 2,000. Now if he can't find anything explicit that refers to the beginning time of Dhuhr or the beginning time of Asr and Maghrib, he will select a hadith which has even the slightest reference to the beginning time of Dhuhr, Asr and Maghrib. And he does that with every single subject. He does that with virtually every single chapter heading. <coughs> now I explain this because this will make clear to the readers and the listeners as to why the book is about Salah. This particular chapter is about the beginning time of Salah. And the hadith which Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi produces under this chapter heading in this particular book is a very long hadith, 99% of which is to do about the signs of the Day of Judgment and Jannat and Jahannam. And one can get lost in the hadith and forget that this hadith has been produced here in order to prove the point of the chapter heading, which is about the beginning time of Dhuhr Salah. This is why Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi does this. So again here, even on the slightest reference, he will use the hadith. Now, before I continue explaining the hadith, I'll explain the, how the hadith relates to and corresponds to the chapter heading. The chapter heading is about the beginning time of Dhuhr, that Dhuhr begins after noon. And Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi finds us in the very first sentence, Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out, i.e. of his house, when the sun had declined and then led Dhuhr Salah. Now one may ask that, yes, but here the Prophet ﷺ did not say that this is a beginning time of Dhuhr Salah. Because in the previous hadith we've learned, the very previous hadith, hadith number 333, that they were traveling, the Mu'addin stood up to give adhan for Dhuhr, the Prophet ﷺ said, wait, let it cool down. Then he waited, then he stood up again to give Dhuhr adhan, the Prophet ﷺ said, wait. So he waited. And then he allowed him to give adhan for dhuhr and they prayed dhuhr salah only once the shadows of the dunes and the small hillocks also became visible, which was quite late into the day. So one may ask, well, is that the beginning time or is this the beginning time? Nowhere in any of these two hadith or in other hadith in this uh, book of Bukhari do we find the Prophet ﷺ actually saying that this is the beginning time of dhuhr and this is, uh, this is the beginning time of dhuhr. So the way Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi operates is as follows. One, as I explained, and what he is trying to demonstrate here is that in all of the recorded ahadith, this is the earliest time that we ever know of the Prophet sallallahu having prayed dhuhr salah, i.e. afternoon. And therefore we know that before noon or at noon, it's not permissible. Anyway, I won't be explaining myself again like that for the rest of the book, because this story will be repeated, and this process of Imam Bukhari and his procedure will both be repeated in the remaining chapters about all of the timings of Salah. Now, to explain the hadith itself, Prophet ﷺ came out of his house when the sun had declined, precisely afternoon. He led people in Dhuhr Salah, and then he ascended the mimbar, the pulpit. Now, he was angry, he was already angry as we learn from other narrations. Then the Prophet ﷺ gave a khutbah in which he spoke in detail about the hour of judgment. And he mentioned, فَذَكَرَ أَنَّ فِيهَا أُمُورًا عِظَامًا He mentioned that the hour of judgment and the day of judgment 
the Day of Judgment will contain many momentous events, many great events. Then the Prophet ﷺ, in his anger, also announced to the people that whoever wishes to ask me something, let him ask me. And one of the reasons for the Prophet Sallallahu's anger was, as we learn from some narrations, that the hypocrites were saying about the Prophet Sallallahu during this time that he was unable to answer their questions. And they were trying to foment and create trouble by pestering the Prophet Sallallahu with silly and necessary futile and irrelevant questions. And they would do this deliberately in order to offset the Prophet ﷺ, in order to catch him off guard, or they thought, and in order to put him in a very difficult position in the hope that he may not be able to answer some of their questions. And they would also go away and say that he is unable to answer all of our questions. So the Prophet ﷺ was at that time particularly angry about this. Therefore, in his anger he said, Whoever wishes to ask me anything, let him ask me. For you will not question me about anything except that I will inform you of it and provide its answer whilst I am still present here. As long as I remain in this place of mine, i.e. on the mimba. Now, some of the people did not understand. So one of them, who, whose name was Abdullah, People, unfortunately, from the days of Jahiliya, from before, had been whispering rumors that his father, Hudhafa, was not his true father, but that his father was someone else. Now, it was unfortunate this rumor was not instigated after Islam, but it was being whispered before Islam, before the days of Islam. So Abdullah ibn Hudhafa stood up and thought to himself, that, let me clear this once and for all. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, who is my father? So the Prophet ﷺ said, your father is Hudhafa. I.e. the very father that you think is your father, he is your true father. And we learn from hadith number 81, that someone else also asked the Prophet ﷺ, who is my father? The Prophet ﷺ told him as well. And because the Prophet ﷺ was angry, when these two people stood up and asked questions, the Prophet ﷺ, after answering their questions quite rapidly and angrily, continued to say, go on, question me. Who else wishes to ask me something? You will not ask me anything except that I will inform you. Ask me, ask me. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu recognizing the anger of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wished to appease him and placate him and therefore in all humbleness and humility he, he knelt on his knees he knelt on his knees he was already sitting but he rose and in this very humble and submissive manner he pleaded with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appeasing him and pacifying his anger and saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam رَضِيْنَا بِاللَّهِ رَبَّ وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينَا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ نَبِيَّا sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we are content with Allah as a Lord with, the Prophet, with Islam as a religion and with Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our messenger, we will not question you, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became silent. Then he later on said to this same assembly of people, and as I said earlier, some people did not recognize this anger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but most did. And because of his speech, and his khutbah and his sermon on the hour of judgment and the signs and the great events that shall precede the final hour. And because of his anger and his saying, ask me, many people began crying excessively, but some didn't understand. Then when the Prophet Sallallahu anger was finally pacified, he told the Sahaba anhum that I was shown the fire and paradise. Now, just now, i.e. when I was in Dhuhr Salah, when I was praying Dhuhr Salah, I was shown the pa I was shown paradise and the fire in the center of this wall, across this wall. And never have I seen such evil, i.e. like the evil of Jahannam. And never have I seen such good as the good of paradise. 
Then Imam Bukhari, uh, Imam Zainuddin Zabid rahmatullahi says that this hadith has already passed in the Book of Knowledge and from the narration of Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, he explains why he's repeating the hadith here. He says, I've repeated the hadith here even though I have an undertaking in the I have an undertaking in this abridgment that I would not repeat any of the ahadith of Bukhari. The only reason I've repeated this hadith is that in this particular narration, there are, there are additional words and there are also many different words. There's a difference of wording and addition of wording. Hadith number 335. Anabi Barzat radiallahu anhu qal, it is related from Abu Barzah radiallahu anhu that he said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يصلي الصبح وَأَحَدُنَا يَعْرِفُ جَلِيسَ The Prophet وسلم, would pray the morning prayer and one of us could recognize his companion. وَيَقْرَأُ فِيهَا مَا بَيْنَ السِّتِّينَ إِلَى الْمِئَةِ And in, Fajr, in the morning prayer, the Prophet وسلم, would recite in between 60 to 100 verses. وَيَصُلِّ الظُّهْرَ إِذَا زَالَتِ الشَّمْسِ And he would pray Dhuhr Salah when the sun had declined. وَالْعَصْرَ And he would pray Asr Salah وَأَحَدُنَا يَذْهَبُ إِلَىٰ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ فَيَرْجِعُ الشَّمْسُ حِيَّةِ He would pray Asr Salah and one of us would then travel to the furthest part of Medina, of the city, and return, return, i.e. to his home, and I will explain, whilst the sun was still bright. The narrator, one of the narrators, one of the sub-narrators of the hadith, and the narrator forgot what Abu Barza al-Aslami radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said about Maghrib Salah. Qala, he then also said, وَلَا يُبَالِي بِتَأْخِيرِ الْعِشَاءِ إِلَىٰ ثُرُثِ الْلَيْلِ ثُمَّ قَالِ إِلَىٰ شَطْرِ الْلَيْلِ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not be concerned by delaying the Isha Salah till one third of the night. ثُمَّ قَالَ He then said, i.e. the narrator then said, إِلَىٰ شَطْرِ الْلَيْلِ till half of the night. Last translation of the hadith, I'll explain. Here Abu Barza al-Islami radiyallahu ta'ala and one of the companions gives a general guideline as to when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray the five times salah. So he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would pray fajr salah whilst in such a way that one of us could recognize his companion, i.e. it would not be in complete darkness but it would be in some light, the kind of light that we see before uh, sunrise. So w- one of us could recognize his companion, so it wouldn't be completely dark. And in Fajr Salah, the Prophet وسلم, would recite between 60 to 100 verses, he would recite the long surahs. There are certain sections of the Quran that are desirable and sunnah to recite in different salawat. And the longest dilawah of the Prophet وسلم, used to be in Fajr Salah as well as Dhuhr Salah but mainly Fajr. Then Abu Barzah radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi would pray Dhuhr Salah when the sun would decline. And this is related to the chapter heading. With this Imam Bukhari mentions a point that Dhuhr time begins when the sun declines immediately after noon. Well, Asr, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would pray Asr Salah whilst one of us, I Abu Barzah alayhi wa says, one of his companions, would travel to the furthest part of Medina and return. Now this does not mean, this does not mean that he would travel from the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the furthest part of Medina and then return to the masjid. No. What this means is people would come from different parts of Medina, including the furthest ends of Medina, to pray salah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would spend the day here or the main part of the day. Then in the evening, especially after Asr, or after Maghrib, many of them would return to their homes. So those of them who would return after Asr, he says, 
And the Prophet ﷺ would pray Asr. And then one of us would travel to the furthest part of Medina and return to his house, i.e. where he set off from earlier in the day. So it's not like he goes from the masjid to his house and then returns to the masjid. No, he would, one of us would travel to the furthest end of Medina and return, i.e. return to his house. So it's a one-way journey, not two-way journey. Whilst the sun was still bright. Now, I mention that because in other narrations, it's very clear that it's a one-way journey and not a two-way journey. One, and the Rawi, the narrator, forgot what the Prophet, what Abu Barzah anhu said about Maghrib Salah. And he said that about Isha Salah, mainly the Prophet wasallam, he wouldn't be too concerned if he delayed Isha Salah till <coughs> one third of the night. I mentioned earlier, this is a desirable time. Thumma qala, he then said, i.e., one of the narrators, on one occasion, whilst narrating this hadith, he would say one third of the night. And on other occasions, on, an, on another occasion, instead of saying one third of the night, the narrator of the hadith said half of the night. So which of the two is correct? In fact, both of them are correct, as is mentioned in many ahadith. Most often the Prophet ﷺ would delay only till one third of the night. On certain occasions he did delay till half of the night, so both are correct. Now, inshallah, I will explain about the different salawat. I will explain about the timings of the different salah as we move from one salah to the other. But because we are uh, studying the time of Dhuhr at the moment, this hadith and the one before it both clearly explain that the beginning time of Dhuhr is immediately afternoon. The next chapter in the hadith, Babu Ta'khiri Dhuhr ila al Asr, chapter about delaying Dhuhr till Asr. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi does not mention explicitly the end time of Dhuhr. So he doesn't say in the previous chapter, chapter about the beginning of Dhuhr. And then here he says chapter about the end time of Dhuhr. He doesn't. Previously he mentions the beginning time of Dhuhr. And then here he speaks about the about delaying Dhuhr Salah till Asr. And then in the next chapter, he straight away begins to, well, he mentions the beginning time of Asr. So he doesn't mention the end time of Dhuhr. I mention that because that's the only way we will really understand what this chapter heading means. Babu Ta'khid al Dhuhr ila al Asr. Chapter about delaying Dhuhr till Asr. Obviously, a few, well, a few things can be understood from the chapter heading. And the hadith that he produces to support this chapter heading. One, although it's valid to pray Dhuhr at the beginning time, immediately afternoon, as we've learned from the previous hadith, and it's also desirable and recommended to delay the Dhuhr Salah in intense heat and pray it after some time. It's also permissible to pray Dhuhr Salah right at the end of its time by delaying it to its very end. So that's one point that's proven from this hadith and chapter about, chapter about delaying Dhuhr Salah till Asr. There are a few other points that are also derived from this chapter heading, but they are very complex. So I will mention them once. Those who do understand, alhamdulillah, many of you will. Those who don't, then don't be distressed. They, they are very complex. What it is, is that with, regard, with regards to the timing of Asr Salah, there is some difference of opinion amongst the ulama of Islam. There's one difference of opinion about when Dhuhr ends. There's another difference of opinion about when Asr begins. There's another difference of opinion about whether 
Zuhr and Asr time overlap. And there's also another difference of opinion about whether there is an intervening period between Zuhr Salah time and Asr Salah time when there is no Salah in between. For example, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Yusuf from amongst the Hanafi ulama, Imam Muhammad from amongst the Hanafi ulama, and the majority of the Ummah all say that Asr time begins when the shadow of each object is equal to once its length after the original shadow of the object at noon. <coughs> this time is known as Al Mithlul Awwal. Al Mithlul Awwal. For purpose of for, for the purpose of um, simplicity, I'll just name it Asar One. Asar One. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, believes that Asar time does not begin at Al Mithlul Awwal when the shadow of each object is once its length beyond the original length of that shadow at noon. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi says, Asr time actually begins when the shadow of each object is twice its length after the original size of its shadow at noon. So this obviously is long after, well not long, but it's some time after al mithr al-awwal. What I mean by after its original shadow, this is a pen. Let's say this is a tree. Now, sunrise from the east, you, this way, sunsets in the west. At noon, in most countries close to the equator, there'll hardly be a single, there'll hardly be a shadow. Maybe. A very small shadow because the sun is directly overhead. But in this country, for example, in the UK, the shadow will probably be slightly longer. So let's say the shadow of a tree at noon in this country is about four foot long. That's the original shadow at noon. As the sun continues across the horizon in its passage towards sunset, the shadows will grow longer and longer. Now when the shadow, let's say the tree is 10 foot, its original shadow at the time of noon is 4 foot. When the shadow of the tree becomes 14 foot, i.e. once its length, 10 foot tree, 10 foot shadow, after its original shadow at noon, which is 4 foot, so it becomes 14 foot. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, <coughs> Imam Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, and the majority of the scholars say, at this time, al mithlul awwal, asr 1, asr time begins. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi says, no, later, when the shadow becomes twice <coughs> the length of the object after the original shadow at noon. So according to Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi, four foot we will discount because of the, that's the original size after at noon. Fourteen, ten foot more, first. Ten foot more, twenty-four foot. Okay, this is al mithlul awwal when it becomes twice its length after the original shadow at noon. So obviously there's some delay. So according to Imam Abu Hanifa, it's at a later time. According to the majority of the Ummah, it's at an earlier time. I've, uh, it's famously these two times are known as al mithlul awwal, al awwal, and al mithlul thani. 
Asr 1, Asr 2. Shadow 1, Shadow 2. That's one difference of opinion as to whether the timing, uh, as to when Asr actually begins. That's one difference of opinion. The second difference of opinion is when does Dhuhr end? Now, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam, uh, sorry, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, and the other scholars, except Imam Malik and except Imam Shafi'i, rahmatullahi, according to one narration. Actually, forget that narration of Imam Shafi'i because it's not acted on. So according to Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, most of the scholars, as well as Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, except Imam Malik and except some Shafi'i scholars, Dhuhr time ends and Asr time begins straight away. So if Dhuhr time ends at 5.33, Asr time begins at 5.33 precisely. 5.34. However, according to Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, there is actually an overlap between Dhuhr and Asr time. So according to Imam Malik, Dhuhr time ends and then for a short period approximately enough time to pray four ka'at salah. So shall we say about seven, eight minutes? Not at today's speed, at the speed of the our pious predecessors. Four raka'at salah will take, let's say, eight to ten minutes. Let's say ten minutes. So according to Mamalik rahmatullahi, Dhuhr time does not end as soon as Asr begins. And Asr time does not begin as soon as Dhuhr ends. But the two times actually overlap. For how long? For about ten minutes. So according to Mamalik, the time of Dhuhr blends in with Asr, and there is a period of about 10 minutes, which according to Imam Malik and the scholars that follow him, is actually a time for both Dhuhr and Asr. And there are clear evidences according to Imam Malik, because let me just, as a matter of interest, I'll explain why. In the hadith about Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, descending upon the earth for two days, on the first day, he led Salah at one time and he said, this is the beginning. Then in the, on the next day, he led Salah at a later time and said, this is the end. And the timings for the Salawat are in between these two. So on the first day, according to the Hadith, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam led the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in... Asr Salah, in Asr Salah, sorry, he led him, yeah, he, on one of these occasions, he led the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Dhuhr Salah, when, when the shadow, when the shadow was once the length of the original, uh, once the length of the object after the original shadow, i.e., shadow one, he led the Prophet sallallahu in Dhuhr Salah, at shadow one, and then on the other day he led the Prophet sallallahu in Asr Salah at shadow one. So according to Imam Malik rahmatullah, because of that hadith, he says that the Prophet sallallahu was led in Salah by Jibreel at the same time for both Dhuhr and Asr. So he has his evidence. Anyway, I only mention that as a point of interest. So according to Imam Malik, there's actually about a 10 minute period enough to pray for Raka'at Salah when it's time for both Dhuhr and Asr. So in this he differs from the rest of the ulama and some of the Shafi'i scholars also follow that opinion of Imam Malik because there is one narration of Imam Shafi'i which is to the same effect. That's the second difference of opinion. According to Imam Dawud al-Zahiri rahmatullahi alayhi and some other scholars, again of the Shafi'i fiqh, There is actually an intervening period between Dhuhr and Asr when there is no time for any Salah. So according to them, if Dhuhr ends at 5.30, between 5.30 and 5.40, there is no time for Asr or for Dhuhr. You don't pray any Salah. And then Asr begins sometime after Dhuhr ends at 5.40. So there's an intervening period. <coughs> These are just some of the differences of opinion regarding Dhuhr and Asr Salah. 
Now, I didn't mention the, these differences of opinion to confuse or confound the listeners. I did it for a particular reason. I did say that, you see, the chapter heading, the chapter heading of Imam Bukhari is actually related to these differences of opinion. Because by saying, Babu Ta'khir al-Zuhri ila al-Asr, chapter about delaying Zuhr al Asr, in one stroke, Imam Bukhari has claimed with this chapter heading that by delaying Zuhr al Asr, that means when Zuhr ends, Asr begins. So there's no overlap period as Imam uh, Malik rahmatullahi says. And there is no intervening period as Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi says according to one narration and as some of the Shafi'iya scholars say. But where Zuhr ends, Asr begins. And regarding the first difference of opinion about as to when Zuhr ends and Asr begins, is it Shadow 1 or Shadow 2? Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi does not have any ahadith regarding this topic which are authentic enough and that meet his stringent requirements and conditions. Therefore, he does not mention that difference of opinion. He doesn't mention any ahadith related to it. Now, again, as I said, it's complex. I've mentioned it once. I will not repeat it. Those who understand, alhamdulillah, those who don't, there's no need to worry. Um, another reason why I actually mentioned, I said I didn't mention this to confound or confuse any of the listeners. <laughs> I mentioned these differences of opinion. Because I want to make a very important point here, and I, something that I will repeat later. You see, in Islam, the evidences of the Sharia, the verses of the Qur'an are many, and their interpretations are many. But within certain parameter, parameters and limits. The ahadith number thousands. And the understanding and interpretation and practical application of these ahadith, as demonstrated by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, number many more. Even the companions differed in their understanding and application of the Prophet sallallahu words. <coughs> so there is a wide scope of disagreement, wide scope for difference of opinion in the Sharia. And inshallah, I believe I have demonstrated in virtually every single chapter of this book till today, how the ulama of Islam, who are recognized authorities, differ in their opinions, despite the presence of clear-cut verses of the Qur'an and clear-cut ahadith. And that there should be no anger, no discomfort, no frustration as a result of this. And there should be no narrow-mindedness or bigotry. Now, when we move later, we will come across chapters such as saying Ameen loudly in Salah or not. In fact, Imam Bukhari does not actually, well, that, he won't mention that clearly, but one point which he does mention is about the raising of the hands in Salah. Now, unfortunately, people have made these issues of Salah, such as the raising of the hands in Salah, before and after Ruku and at other occasions saying Ameen loudly, or how they sit in Salah, or where they fasten their hands, they have made these issues so prominent, and they have made them so complicated, and they have turned them and transformed them into standards of judging people. Even though there is a wide scope of disagreement, and for example, the raising of the hands in Salah or not, you know, whether you should raise your hands in Salah or not, as I've explained in detail in my book, the ulama of Islam agree that they are hadith that supports both sides of the argument. The practice of raising the hands as well as not raising them is to be found from the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum themselves. And that difference has existed till this day. And in fact, the ulama of the Hanafi school of fiqh, Imam Malik rahmatullahi and Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi say that the hands are not to be raised. Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal say that the hands are to be raised. However, all of them agree that this is not a question of validity or obligation. It's merely a question of preference. 
Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi and Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi and the scholars that follow them say that it's better not to raise our hands. Otherwise, the ulama of the Hanafi fiqh say that it's a recognized sunnah to raise our hands. And it's a recognized sunnah not to raise our hands. Both are sunnah. For us, it's only a question of preference. The preferred sunnah is not to raise our hands. Now, if this is so clear, if the opinions of these scholars are so accommodating, why is it that we have made this issue such a contentious one? Astaghfirullah, if someone sees another not raising their hands in salah, they say that your salah is batil. That you, here is a hadith and you are acting on the opinion of Abu Hanifa and not on the hadith of, Imam, uh, of the Prophet wasallam. Just about, specifically about the raising of the hands. And equally so, if someone is raising their hands in salah, there are those who find this offensive and say, what's he doing? And why is he acting on this hadith? Why doesn't he follow this fiqh? Why doesn't he follow the opinion of Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, etc.? It's not a contentious issue. And it shouldn't be made one. And what, what I'm trying to say here in today's discussion is that why are we so worked up? Why do we get so worked up about Amin and about raising the hands when, when the ulama of Islam have differed so profoundly and so intensely about virtually every single issue? Look here. Here we're not talking about the question of preference. We're talking about the timing of the validity of Asr Salah. Yet look at the difference of opinion. According to Imam Malik, Asr Salah and Zuhr Salah actually blend in. According to Imam Shafi'i, one narration. According to some Shafi'i scholars, there's an intervening period where there's no time for Salah. So if someone prayed Dhuhr Salah then, it won't be valid. Someone prayed Asr Salah then, it won't be valid according to these scholars. According to Imam Malik, if someone prayed Dhuhr or Asr, both are valid. According to Imam Hanifa, if someone prays Asr at shadow one, his Salah is not valid. And according to the rest of the scholars, if someone prayed Dhuhr Salah in Asr two, but just before Asr 2, but after Asr 1, after Shadow 1, before Shadow 2, his Salah is not valid. Here they are differing, differing about the validity of Salah. They categorically state that your Salah is not accepted by, your Salah is not accepted and it's not valid. So here they differ so strongly and they differ in so many other issues so strongly. According to one, the wudu is valid. According to the other, the wudu is invalid. According to one, the salah is valid. According to another, the salah is invalid. Yet, people do not even know these differences of opinion. Yet, about a difference of opinion, regarding which nobody has said that the salah is valid or invalid, people get so worked up. All I'm trying to do is put it into context. Inshallah, we'll discuss this more when we actually get to that time. I've mentioned the chapter heading, and... Um, now the hadith. So Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi is demonstrating a number of points through this chapter heading. Hadith number 336. Anna Abbas anhuma. It's related from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma. Anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salla bin madinat al-sab'un wa thamaniyan al-zuhra wal-asr wal-maghrib wal-isha. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed in Medina seven raka'at and eight raka'at. Zuhr al-asr and maghrib al-isha. Now that's the translation of the hadith. Now for those who say that you can just pick up the translation of a book of hadith and understand it and act on it, then I would like them to explain this hadith and act on it. The literal translation of the hadith is that the Prophet Abdullah ibn Abbas says, the Prophet prayed in Medina seven and eight, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha. And I'd also like them to explain the connection of this hadith to the chapter heading. Babu Ta'khir al-Dhuhr ila al-Asr. Chapter about delaying Dhuhr Salat al-Asr. Abdullah ibn Abbas anhuma is speaking about a particular incident in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed Dhuhr Asr Maghrib and Isha each in its own time in the city of Medina. However, he prayed Dhuhr and Asr together and Maghrib and Isha together by combi combining them apparently but praying each Salah in its own time. So he delayed Zuhr Salah till its very end and then he prayed Asr at its very beginning time 
So that the two appeared to be performed together, even though each was performed in its own time. And then he delayed Maghrib till its very end time. And he brought forward Isha till its very beginning time. And therefore Isha and Maghrib and Isha both appeared to be performed at, together, even though each was performed in its own time. And Imam Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas when mentioning this, he mentions eight, seven first, i.e. Isha four and Maghrib three together, sorry, Maghrib three and Isha four together, seven. And he mentions eight, i.e. Dhuhr and Dhuhr four and Asr four together afterwards. So the meaning of the hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ prayed in Medina, seven raka'at together, Maghrib, three, four, Isha. And he prayed eight raka'at together, four Dhuhr and four Asr. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha, all of them together, that's how he mentions it. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed each of these salawat in its own time, but he combined them apparently by performing each by performing Dhuhr at its very end and Asr at its very beginning, so they appear to be performed together. And by praying Maghrib at its very end and Asr uh, Isha at its very beginning, so they appear to be performed together. One can do this today if, for example, uh, Dhuhr Salah ends at 5.30 and Asr begins immediately after at 5.31. Someone prays Dhuhr at 5.20, finishes at 5.29, no, sorry, someone prays Dhuhr at 5.15 and finishes at 5.29 and then waits two minutes and then prays Asr. So they've combined the prayers, but they've still prayed Eid Salah in its own time. Then Maghrib, if Maghrib ends at, let's say, 10.15, uh, so the person prays Maghrib Salah at five minutes past 10, finishes at 10.14, waits two minutes, and then praise Isha Salah in its own time at 10.16. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu did once in al Madinah Al-Munawwarah. It's permissible as long as each Salah is performed in its own time. Now, Imam Bukhari Rahmatullah uses this hadith to prove his points of the chapter heading. That the Prophet Sallallahu delayed Zuhr Salah till its end time. And then as soon as it finished, Asr time began and he prayed Asr. And the, the hadith also proves the other points I mentioned. Now I'll suffice with this hadith, inshallah, in the next uh, lesson on Friday, we will continue with the, begin, with the time of Asr and hadith number 337. I've explained a number of points which I won't be repeating, so the remaining hadith won't be as complex, inshallah. Now, with regards to this question, it's a very important question um, about the timing of Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr Salah. The question is, is it permissible to read Fajr Salah at 1.30 a.m. due to the sun not being below a certain point below the horizon? If this is permissible, for what period of time is this allowed as towards the autumn the sun will go lower under the horizon? Maghrib time ends with the disappearance of twilight. Fajr time begins with the crack of dawn which is also the beginning of twilight. <clears throat> when the sun sets, Maghrib Salah begins. Maghrib Salah time begins when the sun sets below the horizon. Now, once the sun sets below the horizon, the rays, if you imagine this the top part of this podium to be the horizon. The sun sets below the horizon. After setting below the horizon, the rays of the sun continue to light up the atmosphere and the sky reflecting on the clouds, etc. You have this immediate red afterglow and then the white light. And this gradually grows weaker, weaker, weaker until it fades in time. So even though the sun has set, you can see it's still quite bright. So physically, the sun has disappeared, but the afterglow and the after rays of the sun continue to light up the horizon and the sky, reflecting off the atmosphere and the clouds. This is known as twilight. Twilight is strong and it grows weaker and weaker until it finally fades and disappears. So immediately after sunset, you can actually still read a newspaper. Now. 
the, the light continues to fade as the sun sinks deeper and deeper below the horizon until the sun sinks to such a point below the horizon that none of its rays continue to light up the atmosphere and with the last disappear with the disappearance of that last ray twilight ends and true darkness sets in now according to the scholars of the hanafi fiqh this true darkness as soon as it sets in isha begins and maghrib time ends now when is this you see, in moderate climates that are closer to the equator, the timings are much more stable. So the <clears throat> this time would probably be about one hour, 15 minutes. I'm not being scientifically precise, but approximately one hour, 15 minutes, one hour, 20 minutes, let's say. Now, this remains constant throughout the year with a difference of a few minutes here and there. But in this country, in the UK, and in all of the countries that are of an extreme northern latitude, that move further away from the equator, in either direction, the timings are very unstable. Well, they are stable, but they are quite, uh, shall we say, the fluctuations are great. That's why in summer, we have sunset at 9.40. And in winter, we have sunset at 3.50. It's almost a difference of six hours. Now, because the times fluctuate for sunrise, sunset, and the length of the day and the length of the night, the timings for twilight also fluctuate greatly in this country. Now, when the sun sets below the horizon and then twilight disappears, darkness sets in, Isha begins, Maghrib ends. Sun continues on its passage. Then, when the sun is coming up towards the eastern horizon for sunrise, it follows exactly the same pattern as it did at sunset, but in reverse order. So there's true darkness. Then as the sun continues to climb just below the horizon, when it reaches a certain point, its rays first crack through the atmosphere over the horizon and begin to light up the atmosphere. That's a crack of dawn. That's a crack of dawn. With that, twilight begins. It's exactly the same procedure as after sunset, but reverse order. Then the sun continues to climb, climb, climb. More and more rays light up the horizon. It becomes brighter, brighter, even though it's not sunrise yet, until the sun finally meets the horizon and then rises. Now, the period of morning twilight, i.e. from the crack of dawn till sunrise, is exactly the same as evening twilight, from immediately after sunset till the last, last rays disappear. So, morning twilight is Fajr time, evening twilight is Maghrib time. And evening twilight is probably about 1 hour 30 minutes, morning twilight is about 1 hour 30 minutes, roughly. Now, this is okay in climates where the weather and the timings of the sun are moderate and quite stable. But in this country, people think that the, time, the timings for morning twilight, i.e. Fajr time, and evening twilight, i.e. Maghrib time, are stable and constant throughout the year. That is not true. In this country, morning twilight and evening twilight, both are the same. In winter months, can be about 1 hour 15 minutes long. And in summer, they can be 3 hours 15 minutes long. So as the day grows longer, the twilights grow longer also. Because the twilight is the after effect of the day. So if the day is longer, the twilight will be longer. Now, as we move from January, February, March, April, May, June, into the summer months, what happens is that the twilight gradually becomes longer. So, in 
January, probably about half an hour, or one and a half hours, approximately. February, one and a half hours. March, one hour, 45 minutes. April, two hours. Towards the end of April, two hours, 15 minutes. May, two hours, 30, two hours, 45. On both sides, on both sides. Because the twilight is equal on both sides. Now, if Maghrib in May, Maghrib in May is at about, saying roughly about nine o'clock, let's say. Twilight lasts for about two hours, approximately, and more. So Isha will not begin till about 11.15, Now, Fajr will be equally long. The twilight for Fajr, morning twilight, will be equally the same. So it won't be one and a half hours before sunrise, it'll be about two hours, 15 minutes before sunrise. Then by the middle of May, so what, what happens? If, if Maghrib is at about nine, Isha begins at about 11.20, 11.30, let's say roughly 11.30. Sunrise is about 5.30. Let's talk about now. Maghrib was at 9. I believe the true time for Isha Salah is about 11.20 today. 11.20, 2 hours 20 minutes. That's twilight, evening twilight. Morning Fajr is about 5.30, 5.30, 1, 5.33 tomorrow. Take out two and a half hours, approximately. Three o'clock, Fajr begins. Just after three o'clock. So morning and evening twilight are the same. So how many hours of darkness do you have in between, true darkness? 11.30 till about three o'clock. That's about three and a half hours. But in the precise summer months, the twilight on both sides of the day gets longer and longer. So Fajr becomes earlier, True Isha, true set onset of darkness becomes later, later, until there comes a time in the months of June, July, June and July, when the two times actually meet, the two twilights actually meet. So there's a date in May when evening twilight, according to pure scientific calculations and according to the true lighting of the sun, Evening twilight is about, ends at about 110. 1.10. And morning twilight begins at about 1.45. So you've got true darkness for about 35 minutes. And then the next day or two days later, they both meet. So you have this phenomenon known as persistent twilight. Now how is that possible? When I was explaining about the sun dipping below the horizon, you see, in these, country, in these countries of northern, ex- extreme northern latitude, we are closer to the, further away from the equator. What happens at the sun, when it sinks below the horizon, it only, if that's a horizon, the sun only sinks to a certain level, making its passage below the horizon and then rising again. Now, it doesn't sink deep enough for the rays to break off from the atmosphere. And for true darkness to set in, it, because it's moving along beneath the horizon at such a level, so close to the horizon that its, its rays continue to light up the horizon. You've basically got persistent twilight. And that can be understood because if you move further up north, Scotland, the timings are even more extreme. Timings are even more extreme. Go further up north and there is actually, there are places on the earth where the sun does this. It will not sink completely, but it will move along the horizon, half set and half unset. And then you go further up north, close to the poles, and you will actually see that the sun does not dip below the horizon, but it will sink to this level, and then it will continue along the hor- above the horizon, along the sky, for a long, long time. That's where you get sun, uh, sunrise for so many months of the year and you get complete dark sorry and you get complete darkness so many months of the year that just shows that the more further north you go this is what the sun does 
And this is what, in this country, that's what happens. It doesn't set below the horizon deep enough for true darkness to set in. Because it's below the horizon at such a level, at such a dip, that it continues to light up the atmosphere. And you've got this phenomenon known as persistent twilight. And when you've got persistent twilight, basically you've got... You haven't got an end to the evening twilight and you haven't got a beginning to the morning twilight. And that means you've got no end to Maghrib Salat time and you've got no end to, you've got no beginning for Fajr Salat time. This is when the ulama have said that basically there is no Isha time. There is no Isha time. So if there is no Isha time, what do you do? You pray. Either in Maghrib time or you pray in Fajr time. You pray in Maghrib time or Fajr time. Because there's no Isha time. There's no onset of true darkness. Now, most people still think that the evening twilight and morning twilights are constant throughout the year. So if it's one and a half hours in summer, in winter it's one and a half hours in summer. That's why virtually in every masjid or in most masajid, you've got the timetables fixed. So that after Isha, after Maghrib, it's one hour 20 minutes after Maghrib is Isha. It's the same in December and it's the same in summer. Even though you can tell, go outside in summer and you can see it's never truly dark. That's because of the phenomenon of persistent twilight. So most people in blissful ignorance think that Maghrib time only lasts for one and a half hours throughout the year. But that's not true. In my opinion anyway, as I've explained, twilight shortens and lengthens. It retracts and expands according to the length of the day. And because of that, there is a time throughout the year when there is no Isha time. So when there is no Isha time, and you're praying, Maghrib, you're praying Isha in Maghrib time, it basically doesn't make a difference whether you pray immediately after Maghrib, or you pray one hour later with the jama'ah in the masjid. Of course, it's better to pray with jama'ah in the masjid. What I'm saying is according to the timing. Or you pray three hours later, you'll still be praying in Maghrib time. And because Fajr time begins at 1.30, but this doesn't last. It only lasts from May the 17th, I believe. If someone wants the timings, I'll give them the exact timings. I'm only giving them approximate figures here. May the 17th till about July the 10th. Then from July the 10th, the days begin to shorten to such an extent that true darkness sets in. Initially only for about 15 minutes, then half an hour, then 45 minutes. So today, Isha time, there is true darkness. Isha time, I think it's about 11.15 to 11.20. That's true Isha time. But I don't think anywhere in the country you're going to find a masjid that's going to be giving Isha Salah at 11.20. Everyone's praying, still praying in Maghrib time. So when we pray now, Isha, Salah, in Jama'ah together here, Adhan will be at 10.15, and Jama'ah will be at 10.30. It's still Maghrib time. It's still Maghrib time. True onset of darkness is about 11.20. But the ulama have given this concession. That even when there is Isha time, now earlier I said you can pray straight after Maghrib, or you can pray in Maghrib time because there was no Isha time. However, the ulama have also said, based on the evidences, that if Isha is so late that it's very, very difficult for people to pray, then it's still permissible for them to act on the concessions and act on the difference of the opinions of the scholars and pray Isha Salat slightly earlier in Maghrib time. But then where's the defining point? Till what time? Till what date? That is, there's no defining point. I mean, <clears throat> do we continue to pray Isha Salah within Maghrib time until Isha comes down to 11 o'clock, half past 10? I would say that each person should conscientiously think to himself that can I stay awake? and manage to pray Isha Salah in its own time, if you can, then do that. I.e. today, I'll give you the exact timing, I've got it written here. These are the timings for July, okay? I haven't... 
I haven't got my timings for August, but for July, just to give you an example, uh, July the 31st, which was last Wednesday, uh, true sun, a true crack of dawn was about 3.07 in the morning. 5.21 was sunrise. So you've got a difference of two hours and 14 minutes. Isha time, Maghrib was at seven minutes past nine. This was on Wednesday, last Wednesday. And Isha time actually started at 21 minutes past 11, last Wednesday. So you can see the difference. So today it'll probably be about 25 minutes past 11. About five minutes past 11, maybe about 11 o'clock. So who, those of us who feel that they can pray Isha Salah in its own time of true darkness, then they should. If you can't stay awake at all, and you feel that you get to the stage where if you stay awake till after Isha time begins about 11 o'clock, and uh, if you stay awake, you're not going to be able to perform your Salah properly, and if you do, then you'll miss Fajr. Then you can still pray Isha Salah in Maghrib time. So it's, it's a question of personal conscience. But obviously I would say that once true darkness sets in from July the 10th onwards, if you can pray Isha Salah in its own time, even though it's late, i.e. in the months of July, the Isha time will be about, from July the 10th onwards, here I've got the timings here, I'll just pull them out again. This is how rapidly the times change, look. At the beginning of the month, let's say July the 1st, uh, July, from July the 1st all the way to July the 8th, morning twilight and evening twilight remain combined. On July the 9th, morning twilight is at 1.30. Morning twilight is at 1.30, and evening twilight ends at 5 to 1. So you've actually got 35 minutes of true darkness for the first time in two and a half months. Now that's true Isha time. If you can pray Isha in then, that 35 minutes, mashallah, you are muttaqi. <laughs> then, the very next day, morning twilight begins 10 minutes later at 1.39. Isha time is at 12.47. So instantly in one day, one day before you had 35 minutes of true darkness. The very next day, you've got almost 50 minutes of true darkness. And it goes on like that. So, if someone can pray Isha in those times, then they are, they are praying Isha at its proper time. For most people, that's very difficult. Pray Isha at half twelve at night, one o'clock at night. So, if that's the case, then you can still pray Maghrib Salah. You can pray Isha Salah in its Maghrib time. But you should only continue to do that as long as you feel that conscientiously you, you know you cannot pray Isha Salah beyond that time. But today, those of you who feel that you want to pray Isha in its own time, then you should pray after 11. Those of you who feel that, no, I can still pray Isha after 11, but I want to pray with the Jama'ah in the Masjid now, then it's completely valid, you can pray. I'm not claiming about anybody that their Salah is invalid or wrong. I'm not saying anything. I'm just explaining the timings to you. So nobody go away or nobody say that they are said that nobody's praying Isha in the right time. I did not say that. I'm saying these are the timings, these are the rulings of Islam, but I've also explained to you the concessions of the ulama that they allow it, allow Isha Salah to be performed in Smakarib time. I end with this. Uh, I hope I've explained myself. Those of you who require the exact timings throughout the year, for morning and evening twilight, then you can refer to me some other time. I'll, I'll give you the complete timings for the whole year. But that's not my timetable. It's not an official timetable. I'm just giving you a timetable for the timings as they are. I'm not going to create any difference of opinion. I'm not going to create confusion. I'm not going to say that Funa Masjid's timetable is wrong or this one's right and this one's better. No. I've, I've tried to explain it in as broad and as accommodating a manner possible. 
I've said, look, these are the timings. The sun and the moon are not in our hands. Allah controls them. So if twilight, if true darkness sets in at 5 to 1 in the morning, I can't do anything about it and you can't do anything about it. That's when true darkness sets in and that's when Isha time begins. So I've explained the timings to you and I've explained the rulings and I've also said, however, that the ulama have granted concessions in Islam because of extreme necessity and it's permissible to pray Isha Salah in Maghrib time. I end with this. There's very little time because Adhan will be given in in about 10 minutes. So those of you who want to leave, you will have time to leave before Adhan is given. There's one quick question here. Which is the most rewarding? Praying the Jama'ah in the Masjid in Maghrib time at 10.15 or praying alone in Isha time? Obviously, those who pray with Jama'ah will get the reward of Jama'ah, inshallah. And those who decide to pray later can guarantee that their Isha Salah is in Isha time. They can guarantee that and not in Maghrib time. The best thing would be to pray in Jama'ah later. Subhanakallahum bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. This lecture was given by Shaykh Abu Yusuf Riyadhul Haq and has been presented to you by Al Kothar Productions. For further information, additional lectures and books, contact us on 0121-773-5191 or alternatively by post at Al Kothar Productions, P.O. Box 6008, Birmingham, B10 0UW. United Kingdom or visit our website at www.alkotharacademy.org Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh